I grew up on this Batman. This led to the creation of this Batman, a fundamental part of my childhood. When you take this cartoon, this movie, and two of its sequels, I spent more time in Gotham City than I did in my own home. It's a wonder I'm still alive. I would even go so far as to say if it wasn't for this movie, I might not even be a fan of DC Comics today. It will always hold a special place in my heart. But it's easy for any of us to give a pass to entertainment that was a big part of our childhood. And even as an adult, I think there's quite a bit about this movie that works, but it does have some problems. After the Dark Knight movie came out, I became more familiar with the Batman of the comics, and I began to more clearly see what didn't work about some of these Batman movies as Batman stories. But I'm going to try not to say Burton should have just done what Nolan did. Burton didn't have future sight. He was working with the zeitgeist of Batman at that time, a time when superhero movies weren't in vogue, and he had a very limited model to base his own movies on. So as I talk about what could have been done to make this Batman feel a little closer to the Batman I have come to fall in love with, I will be working with what Burton was working with at the time this movie came out. With that being said, let's begin trying to improve on the 1989 Batman movie. The weakest element of this movie is the romantic subplot between Bruce Wayne and Vicki Vale. It's not very well written or developed, and even if it was, I don't see any chemistry between these two actors. While I don't know this for sure, I think this movie felt the need to add a love interest because that's what the first Superman movie did. But Lois Lane has been a consistent fixture in Superman comics since 1938. Even when she and Clark are not dating, she's still there. But Batman, while he has had some romantic liaisons, he does not have a single long-lasting girlfriend. There are long stretches of time where he doesn't have any love interest at all. In the dozens of Batman books I've read, I think Vicki Vale herself showed up in maybe two of them. My personal take on Batman that I don't think anyone else in the world shares is that he is married to his job, and his job happens to be superheroing. So I would remove the romantic subplot, and while we're at it, remove Joker's infatuation with Vicki that takes up like a fourth of his screen time in the movie. Instead of Vicki spending almost all of her time looking into Bruce's past or being a damsel in distress, she will be doing what she and Alexander Knox initially were supposed to be doing when we first meet her, investigating the Batman. While I love Robert Wall's performance in this movie, you almost don't even need him if Vicky does her job and pursues the Batman story. I guess you could have a Nick and Nora type pairing with both of them looking into this, but that would just be another character taking up space. So get rid of Knox, have Vicky doing the stuff he does when we first see him. Maybe not interviewing people, but really pursuing the story. At first, she thinks the Batman is a menace, but by the end of the movie, she sees the good he's done. A lot like Ben Urich's plot in the Daredevil movie, but Vicky doesn't find out Batman's secret identity. The next thing I need to talk about is the Joker having an origin story, and how everyone on the planet has a problem with that. I do not have a problem with it. In the graphic novel The Killing Joke, we get to see what tragically led to Joker's transformation, and Joker says if he must have a past, he wants it to be multiple choice. All that flashback stuff we just read may or may not have been real. This allows other people to do their own take on the Joker while still preserving the mystique. I love the idea of Joker not having a set origin story, but The Killing Joke only came out in March of 1988, while filming for the movie began in October of 1988. Tim Burton claims this comic was a big influence on the movie, and that may have been what ruffled everyone's feathers, since the plot of the movie doesn't share anything in common with the comic, other than a guy falling in a vat of chemicals. In such a short amount of time, I seriously doubt anyone working on the movie even knew about the existence of the Killing Joke comic. Sam Hamm's first script for the movie is dated 1986. Sure, there were other drafts, but I doubt they read The Killing Joke before the final version of the script was completed. So people get angry that this movie depicts a solid origin for the Joker, with no room for mystery. But before The Killing Joke came out, the idea that Joker was once the Red Hood who fell in a vat of chemicals, that was his definitive origin, going back to 1951. My dad read comics in the late 70s, early 80s, and he remembers a story where Batman figured out that the Red Hood eventually became the Joker. When the movie came out, that was firmly entrenched in the mythos of Batman. All they did was remove the actual Red Hood helmet, and that's Joker's origin from the comics. So that stays in my fix. While we're on the Joker, let's talk about the other thing everyone hates about this movie. Joker is the one who killed Batman's parents. This I cannot defend. I don't hate it as much as Sebastian Shaw killing Magneto's mother in X-Men First Class, but it is inexcusable. Why do this? It makes the world of Batman feel smaller, when a bad guy who killed his parents is also the same guy terrorizing the city 20-something years later. It also turns Batman into a creature of vengeance, which he should not be. This also started something of a trend in superhero movies, where the villain has to somehow be connected to the hero's tragic origin. Two-Face kills Robin's parents, Kingpin kills Daredevil's dad, Ironmonger hired terrorists to kill Tony Stark. I'm genuinely surprised Norman Osborn didn't kill Uncle Ben. Most of the time, this is needlessly simplistic. How best can we connect something that happened to our character to something else happening in the movie? But if you say someone else killed the Waynes, it's not like it's suddenly a sprawling, incomprehensible plot. Look at the first Superman movie. The main villain is Lex Luthor, but he's not responsible for Krypton exploding. Making the Joker the guy who killed the Waynes feels just as silly to me. Say some other guy killed his parents. I guess maybe you run the risk of Bruce becoming Batman specifically 
specifically to catch his parents killer which I don't like but it is better than what the movie did. You might be tempted to compare this to X2 which combines William Stryker who appeared in maybe one X-Men comic before X2 came out with the Weapon X program responsible for Wolverine's origin story. I can't explain why I'm okay with that and not okay with the Joker killing the Waynes. Maybe because William Stryker was so incredibly minor and the bad guy behind the Weapon X project didn't even have a name when he was first introduced. So combining those threads while still making it work with the broad strokes of God Loves Man Kills, the original story with Stryker, worked for me. But Joker has hundreds of stories he's been in. You don't have to increase his importance in the mythos by having him be responsible for the creation of Batman. While we're on the Joker, let's simplify what his end game is in the movie. I think Joker's unpredictability works a lot better in the comics than it does in the movies. In the comics, you can do as many Joker stories as you want with different tones and flavors, and sometimes he might even change his evil scheme mid-story. In Arkham Asylum Living Hell, Joker decides he's going to kill people whose names are palindromes because it's funny to him. That was a great Joker moment, but having him go all over the place with different plans that don't fit together in a movie that is supposed to be one cohesive story doesn't work as well. This movie has Joker wanting to take over the Gotham criminal underworld, kill Batman because he's jealous, get in Vicky Vale's pants, and poison all the pretty vain people of Gotham. And only Gotham because I guess this city produces their own beauty products and doesn't ship them to other parts of the world or order beauty products from other cities when they find out they are being poisoned. And at the end, maybe he's kind of doing the thing the Dark Knight Joker did where he wants to prove how awful everyone is since they're willing to beat each other up for free money. But I'm not sure if that's actually what's going on here or if I'm reading too much into it. That's maybe five different supervillain schemes at work here and none of them work together. So we've already removed Vicky Vale as an object of Joker's desire. Let's say Joker isn't interested in running the crime rackets of Gotham in the least, but he wants to use the resources for what his big plan should be, putting creepy smiles on the people that he kills. And his various attempts to kill Batman can be to get him off his back so he can do what he really wants to do. And these attacks aren't rooted in jealousy. As for the poisoning the people story, like I said, the beauty products being made in Gotham and only being distributed in Gotham is one of those things I don't think anyone in this movie really thought about. Or if they did, they didn't want the audience to think about it either. I like the idea of Jack Napier being kind of vain, fixing his tie, saying nice outfit to Batman, and even complimenting Vicky Vale's apartment later on. It's not hitting you over the head with it, but he's obsessed with physical appearance, so getting mutilated breaks him. Not exactly the Joker from the comics, but for a one-off story, cool, I buy it. Then he wants to take that away from everyone else, so he hits them where it hurts, in the beauty supplies. Thematically, that works fine, even if people would still complain that that's not how it is in the comics. But I would change the delivery mechanism of how Joker poisons these people. Maybe he coats the boxes of beauty products already in the stores, and it can be more of a detective story. There's this famous comic from the 1970s, The Laughing Fish. They even partially adapted it into an episode of Batman the Animated Series. That story has Joker announcing he's going to kill different people by name, and then the police and Batman try to save these people, and they fail. And then they find out how the Joker did it after the fact. You could do something like that here, where Batman thinks that killing is being done one way, then another death. Uh-oh, I was wrong. Home Batman's detective skills as the movie moves forward. The movie we get, Batman buys a bunch of stuff and then runs some tests off screen. Not much of a detective story featuring the world's greatest detective. Maybe this is how Alicia, Jack's girlfriend from before he became the Joker, could die. You could say she's obsessed with appearance also, and Joker kills her when she wants nothing to do with him now. Again, not exactly the Joker, but it would work with what is already going on in this movie. Following what I've laid out would shorten this movie quite a bit, so to keep this roughly the same length, I would want to focus more on the friendship of Jim Gordon and Batman, kind of like Batman Year One, with more of a focus on Batman. While I give everyone who worked on this movie a pass for maybe not reading The Killing Joke, there is no excuse for Year One, which came out in 1985, a year before Ham's first script for this movie was dated. With this movie covering Bruce's earliest days as Batman and becoming accepted as an ally to the police department by the end, that's kind of the plot of Year One, just with the supervillain as the main villain instead of corrupt cops and politicians. This movie should have borrowed some of that stuff from Year One. Not Gordon starting at the bottom and being promoted to captain at the end, you can still have him be commissioner through the whole movie. But the part about Gordon slowly realizing Batman is an ally in the comic, that would have been great. In the same way that Vicky would be coming around on Batman over the course of the movie, Gordon could as well. It'd be fun to see the two of them separately pursuing the Batman case in different ways and coming to the same conclusion by the end. Sam Hamm's original script had Jim Gordon, still a beat cop, be the one who comforts Bruce after his parents died. And apparently, they even shot that scene, but for some reason, chose not to go in this direction. This is a fantastic addition to the mythos, which Batman Begins later used to great effect. And if they kept this scene, I think they would have been forced to follow it with more interplay between Gordon and Batman. Maybe not as much as what Year One or Batman Begins did, but at least some. True, Ham's 1986 script didn't have any interactions between Bruce and Gordon, but that script also spent a lot of time on the Vicky Bruce romance, and since I would be cutting that, you would have room to develop this friendship. I think this would have gone a long way to fix a not very good portrayal of Gordon in these movies. Gordon gets 
gets cartoonier with each movie, to the point where he feels more like the lovable goof Chief O'Hara in the 1960s Batman show by the time you get to Batman and Robin. I don't think Pat Hingle was the best choice for Gordon, although he is at his best with this character in this movie. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but physically, I don't see Gordon when I look at Hingle. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy who spent the last 20 years fighting a losing battle to keep the city safe. He feels more like he spent most of his career behind a desk, and him coming to stop Eckhart from killing Jack Napier is the first time he's gone out in the field in years. I'd rather have a happy medium between the two Frank Miller versions. Not as young as year one, but not ready to be forced into retirement like in The Dark Knight Returns, either. Cast Charles Bronson or Clint Eastwood if you could afford one of them. Someone I could see running into Axis Chemicals to kick butt and take names. And he's all out of names. The last thing that needs to be addressed is Batman killing so many people, which is one of those things I didn't hate until I started reading lots of Batman comics. It really only happens in the final act of the movie, which is even weirder to me than if he did it throughout the whole thing. While I don't want Batman to kill at all, I would have liked it better if he was doing it from the beginning. It could have been a 1930s throwback, and he uses guns, and then the media blaming Joker's crimes on Batman would make a little more sense, because this Batman would actually be dangerous. We already know Tim Burton has an interest in period pieces, considering movies like Ed Wood, Edward Scissor, hands and big eyes. So why not do that with Batman and try to mirror the Batman of those earliest comics? That would at least be more consistent than having him go from trying to save Jack Napier when he's about to fall in the chemicals to blowing up more people in Axis chemicals than Joker killed in the entire movie. And I don't want this to sound mean, but since Batman doesn't kill anyone for the first two thirds of the movie, it really does feel like Burton and friends didn't know how to end the movie. So suddenly, Bruce decides to blow up the place where Joker is making the gas. But he found out much earlier in the movie that Jack Napier was still alive when Joker killed the mobster with the feather. Once you've found out he's poisoning people, it's a logical assumption that he's using the giant chemical factory where you thought he died. If you're going to just blow it up anyway, why not do it much earlier in the movie? If you don't mind killing people, why not shoot Joker in the face when you're rescuing Vicki Vale in the museum? Obviously, the movie would have been much shorter if they did that, but that's what makes me think they didn't know how to end the movie, so Batman Becomes a Mass Murderer is glued onto the first two acts. So removing stuff like Batman's personal revenge against the Joker, saving Vicki Vale, and committing murder, Murder, that will require pretty much changing all of the third act of the movie. So from the top, here's what my 1989 Batman movie would more or less look like. District Attorney Harvey Dent, okay, let me talk casting here. I've spoken to some people who didn't like Billy D. Williams as Two-Face. I'll confess, I'm not very familiar with much of his filmography. In fact, I don't think I've seen anything he's been in except for Batman and Star Wars. He had cameos and scrubs and Lost, but that amounts to about three minutes of screen time. So I don't know if he could do the seriousness of Two-Face, but I know I disliked what Tommy Lee Jones did with Batman. Batman Forever, so if I had to choose, I would go with Billy D. And I've heard some people say he would have been too old to play the character by then, but Robert Downey Jr. was 54 when Avengers Endgame came out, and Billy D. wouldn't have been much older than that when Batman Forever came out. So I think he would be fine as Harvey and later Two-Face. Okay, District Attorney Harvey Dent and Police Commissioner Gordon are fighting a losing battle to clean up the city. They've made progress, but it's a lost cause, with corrupt city officials and Gordon not even sure who he can trust in the police force, since he has suspicions many of them are in the pocket of mob boss Sal Moroni. Oh, I'm changing Carl Grisham to Sal Moroni. No other changes needed. Meanwhile, photojournalist Vicki Vale investigates rumors of a vigilante named Batman who has been non-lethally targeting the city's criminals for a few months. Moroni sends his number one guy, Jack Napier, into a trap because Napier was sleeping with Moroni's girlfriend. It's here that Gordon first finds out the Batman is real, and Napier is accidentally dropped into some chemicals that disfigures him and finally breaks his brain. Okay, pause real quick. I never understood how exactly this works, but Jack shoots Batman, Batman pulls a bullet's and bracelet, and the bullet ricochets back at Jack and somehow mutilates his mouth so that he's permanently smiling. That was the intention in the script, but that physically makes no sense. Wouldn't he lose most of his teeth if the bullet somehow did that? Can't we just say the chemicals somehow, no pun intended, jacked up his face? Anyway, Napier takes on the name The Joker, murders Moroni for betraying him, and murders the other Gotham mob bosses, taking over the entire criminal underworld. Vicki Vale is pressuring Gordon to give her a scoop on the Batman, and Gordon is still adamant that there is no such thing, all while Batman is calling Gordon, trying to tell him that he's an ally, and they need to work together to stop the Joker, but Gordon is not having any of it. Batman may have some wonderful toys, but Joker has the mob on his side, and Batman also has to contend with the few honest cops who think that he is just as much of a threat as Joker is, and the corrupt cops helping Joker and his goons on the side. Joker begins poisoning various people around the city, at first in slow starts, but his killing increases when the police and Batman are unable to figure out how Joker is doing this. Joker does not do a commercial advertising smilex, but his infamy increases as more and more dead people with creepy smiles are showing up. 
With the help of Alfred, in a scene kind of like that one in Batman Forever, where they crack Riddler's riddles, Batman sends the information both to Gordon and to Vicki Vale. Instead of Joker going on TV and telling the city he will be giving away millions of dollars to lure them into the streets, Joker offers $20 million to whoever will kill the mayor in the city's 200th anniversary parade. The mayor is an idiot and insists on showing up to the parade, and says that Joker isn't going to intimidate him, and Gordon should have caught him by now. Of course, this leads to chaos, keeping Gordon and his few honest cops busy trying to protect the mayor, while Batman somehow figures out that Joker is going to poison everyone at the parade. Batman uses the Batwing to take away the balloons, but Joker was anticipating Batman's arrival, and one of his men in a police force shoots the Batwing down. Just when you think everybody, mob, good, and bad cops, are going to go after Batman, Gordon gets on the walkie and says Batman is on our side. A wounded Batman will go after Joker, while Gordon and his men are able to get the mayor to safety. Their final showdown can be on top of a building, like in the movie, but instead of Batman causing Joker to fall to his death, Joker somehow dies by his own petard and falls off because he's looking behind him shooting at Batman. Or if you don't like that these movies kept killing off the villains, you can have Joker gleefully jump off the building just as a middle finger to Batman, but Batman saves him and he goes to Arkham Asylum at the end of the movie. I wouldn't be bringing him back for later movies though, so he could die here and I would be fine with that too, as long as Batman doesn't kill him. The movie ends with Commissioner Gordon publicly announcing that Batman is not the threat they believed he was, and he will be working with the police in helping them track down the rest of Joker's gang. They unveil the Bat-Signal and the movie ends. My version isn't really all that different from the movie we got. While a lot of people hate on this movie these days, I think there is a good film, even a good Batman film, buried under some of the big problems that I tried to do away with or minimize. So that's all I have. I hope you guys like this one, and if you did, be sure to check out some of my other videos I do. Some of them are like this one where I try to fix what I see as a broken movie, and some of my videos are nothing like that. In any case, I'll see you guys in the future. Have a good one.